My name is Ed Barrett, and uh, uh, welcome to the Corbett uh, Poetry Series at MIT, sponsored by Comparative Media Studies and Writing uh, Program at MIT. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure, and it is a pleasure, to uh, welcome David Thorburn, reading from his recently published first book of poetry titled Knots. David is a distinguished professor of literature and media at MIT and a beloved and award-winning teacher to generations of MIT students who have taken his popular film class, Film and Literature. As I mentioned, uh, David will be reading from Knots, his first book of poetry. With the title like Knots, you might expect poems that are written in, you know, a knotty, difficult to untangle style. But the poems, at least in my reading of the book, in this book, are written with an open, direct style, embracing family, marriage, sex, sports, history, and now and then a Greek god or the 50s TV character Ralph Cramden. It's a subtle, quick paced book, just like life. After his reading, David will be happy to answer questions, uh, comments that you're writing in the chat. Um, thingamajig. Uh, and he will respond to, uh, to those questions. So please welcome our new poet, David Thorburn. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> uh, I'm very grateful. That was a very generous introduction. And thank you, everyone who's here, colleagues, former students, family. Thank you all. Dressed for the day. Dressed for the day at 93 in flannel shirt and khakis. He warned me to keep the coffee hot and was a corpse three minutes later. I touched his arm, raised and dropped it. I touched his forehead. He seemed asleep, but cold. He knew knots and rigging, varieties of the hammer, marlin spikes, masonry, copper. That's the first poem in my book. The book was, although I've been writing poems on and off all my life, uh, uh, jiggering with them and playing with them, uh, I, I'd never thought seriously about publishing more than an occasional poem. I never thought of myself as writing a book of poems, but a spurt of grief and creativity combined caused me to begin to write much more seriously when my father died. And that poem was the first poem I wrote, although the original version of it was three times longer than the poem, than the poem I read to you. And what emerged was a book uh, in which the through line uh, was the story of my relation to my father. And as you can see, it opens with his death. So there's no, no mystery about that. And, and it, it isn't actually a biography of my father or myself, but it may be a kind of biography of, the, of my ambivalence toward this extraordinary man, uh, this extraordinary and in many ways, Dane difficult man. Uh, so there's a through line in the book in which every few, uh, every four or five poems, there's another short poem about my father, all together mounting, I hope, amounting to a kind of interesting portrait. And then interspersed with that are other poems drawn from family life. Ed gave a very generous description of the range of the book, and I fear it was more generous than I deserve, because when I look back at the book, I myself was shocked by how bloody literary it is, uh, and uh, even even some of the poems are forms of literary criticism. Not really surprising, I suppose, given who I am. Uh, but but uh, uh, I think actually some of the in most interesting poems in my book are a kind of literary criticism. Not really so surprising when you think that poetry itself is often that, 
a form of interpretation, a, f a reading of the world, a reading of objects, and many poems are readings of texts, as is this one. Hat trick. In The Adventures of the Blue Carbuncle, Holmes deduces an intelligent, once respectable tradesman in degraded lodgings, whose wife no longer loves him. All this from a tattered bowler, whose size means brain power, whose broken chin band proves foresight corrupted, whose yellowing stains disclose a stumbling candle holder, a stumbling candle holder sneaking late to bed in a flat not lit by, by gas, unloved by one so careless of this grimy unbrushed felt this grimy unbrushed felt amazing dr watson not to mention us inside their parallel universe where crime and married life parse like this sentence <laughs> well one of the things that um uh, bore in on me uh, after I that, that, that I sort of discovered with, with an embarrassed shock because I should have realized this uh, 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 when I was asked to do an occasional reading and I haven't read very often this is only the third or fourth time I've read and I'm uh, v very grateful for the opportunity um, but I, be I became very conscious of the difference between poems that you speak to an audience even a virtual audience uh, um, and poems that you write that are that you imagine are read in the privacy of her own space by a reader who has the book in front of her, and and uh, it's a different relationship in a certain way, uh, and uh, uh, there are complications about it that are that are worth thinking about. In any case, here's a poem in which it seems to me the spacing of the the arrangement of the poem on the page is part of its meaning. And I like the poem so much, I think it's a, a, a valuable poem. I want to read it anyway, even though I think it needs to be on the page. Uh, but I, I will try to compensate for that by describing its format. The poem belongs to the category, to the old famous category of poetry called ekphrasis, which is uh, 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 derived from the Greek. And it means it's a description. It means a description of any artwork. A description of a painting especially and there is a great tradition of poetry about this as many of you must realize uh, and this in a way is my contribution to that conversation um, uh, but the uh, conversation is complicated by the fact that the full effect of the poem of my poem depends on the ending where after the poem is over, there is in italics, right justified, a replication of the legend that's posted about the painting, which I'm describing in the poem, uh, in, uh, uh, at the bottom of the frame. And the poem, in a way, depends on what happens when the reader gets there. So I, I thought of reading this first, but that would spoil the experience of the poem. I just guess it means you should listen extra, care extra carefully. Uh, because I think, I intend, I suppose, that the reader be driven back to reread. The poem is titled Leaves. Leaves. In the Leopold Museum in Vienna, way up, floors above the sullen shilas, their grimacing gaudy cunts and faces, and Janssen's yowling pencils of himself, bug eyes, bloating cheeks, hair and the top of his head dissolving, irradiating out and away like nebulae. After all these paintings, a winter pastoral so modest, you almost pass it by. Hundreds of withered leaves floating in windless air bring dull color to a regiment of slender trees, stalks of white bark, branches, the children, two of them in winter wrappings small against the trees and empty sky, foraging for beech nuts in the snow. Theodor von Hormann, 1840, 
1895. Baron im Winterlichen Buchenwald, 1892. Peasant children in wintry beech forest. Oil on canvas, painted in Dachau, Bavaria. Morning watch. Tiger loose on deck. First mate Thorburn tackles his captain to stop him firing the handgun. Rips free of his shirt to wave it like a flare, or so he'll tell it years on to his son. As the creature coils in the early glare and starts her death by water in the fiery air. I remember when I first wrote this poem, I got a kind of thrill, an impulse that maybe you're really a poet when I had the triple rhyme of flare, glare, air. <laughs> Not so surprising, but for a first time poet, a very, a very exciting, a very exciting discovery. Excuse me about that. Well, one, one of the things, one of the things I, I uh, uh, like to do um, is, is um, I'm looking for page numbers here. I, for, pardon me. Uh, I, one of the things I like to do sometimes is play is play with titles. Uh, use titles that that aren't that, that don't exactly mislead, but that have a kind of ambiguity in them and maybe mislead slightly. In one, in, in, and I'm, I, 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 th I, I hope I have time to read two examples of that uh, stratagem uh, um, in, in 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 a second. So the first of these uh, poems is called Quibble. Quibble. I see them quibbling over our stuff, loving as they are at heart. Who gets the kitchen burrow? Vampire woman chomping lunch. Who'll want the brass Lincoln bookends? Abe's poor Abe's right arms, casualties of our march to Boston. Which of them will have the message of the Mediterranean bedroom? Hardly scuffed, dear, after 45 years. Your library of architecture, our dictionaries. I fear dispersal and dismemberment. Well, here's another of those kind of poems, poems with, with what I guess modestly tricky titles. I'm sorry about the page turning. It's bad for me not to, my, my book, my bookmarks fell apart a bit. This poem, this, this poem is called Bridling. Bridling at the insinuation he's shit to his master, the bridler toys with revenge. Maybe bridling my lord's big chestnut with a virgin bit, she'll spit in rage in half a mile and rub his fucking arse, arsehole off her back against the willow branches in the swamp along the river. How many boys and men in saddlery and harness making then, then. He's not primitive, technology deprived, but literate, generous, adept among his world's deep systems of transport, caste, and commerce. He won't bloody the grand creature's tender mouth, lucky for pox nose, and selects a gentler harness hating how she lifts her quivering lips to take the iron in. Here's a poem. Here's a poem from my basketball buddies. Running the break. Not rushing is the secret. Under control, never full out, but in a range of speeds. 
keep the ball to the top of the key or else the foul line, ready to pop from 18 or bounce pass left or right, or take it down the lane and dish, or kiss it off the glass yourself, or take it to the rim, or kick it to the shooter in the corner. <laughs> well, I mentioned uh, 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 a, a moment ago that, that uh, I was struck when I began to think about the oral presentation of poetry, about how much more vulnerable and intimate you become when you have a real audience and when you're speaking. You're, and there are poems in my book that make me very uncomfortable to do that uh, with. Uh, and I, uh, but I thought if I mentioned this at all, I had to give you an example. So this is one of the poems that that, uh, um, and I think I think it, it demonstrates why, uh, if you think about it as a as a message that I might send to someone sitting reading in her room, why that would be an easier message, an easier confession about my family's stories to make, not to mention more scandalous kinds of confessions that are typical of confessional poetry. I mean, it's a very rich, interesting topic. Great oral presentations may not be the best kinds of written poems. Anyway, here's a poem. Cremains. When she came out to you, it's no excuse that you were 90 and Claire no longer there to steer you from your brutal deeps. Weeping, she hears you say you cannot love her anymore. And then that sailor's tale of murdering queers at night. This isn't the worst that can be told of you either. I wish it could pour out of me. Your stories of square heads, Calicax, Messinos, the saddle cinch used more than once on me and Andy. But then you're teaching me hand tools, digging the constellations, the slingshot you carved, mythic gift to your David perfect organic Y of oak, the sling a rigger's gift, a sculpted tool for killing rabbits and small birds. At times I want to spit in your ashes, still in their blue canister, cremains of Frank Thorburn, shelved in a back closet where no one goes. Sometimes, one of the things I discovered as I was, began to write really seriously was how much poets need, need encouragement and how tender they are when they're given criticism, even when they claim they want it. Um, and uh, uh, I, showed some, I showed the poem I'm about to read to a number of friends, including a couple of poet friends, and they were quite negative about it. And I was very down in the dumps, even though I liked the poem. And then I showed it to another poet friend his name was Joel Agee. Thank you, Joel. And Joel got it. Joel loved the poem. Joel understood what I was saying. And I resolved that I had res a, a new rule, maybe call it the Thorburn Agee rule. If one person really likes your poem, publish it. <laughs> Here it is. Palest fires may still sear. We know, of course, that for the Jews of Europe, the Messiah did not come says Mr. Spock on NPR, in his earthly guise as the actor Nimoy, introducing Lauren Bacall to read Bernard Gurney's English version of Isaiah Spiegel's Yiddish story of the dog, Nicky, a dog story, bereaved by Hitler of his master, Jacob Simon Temkin fur dealer, and later exterminated by machine gun with his mistress, the widow Anna Nikolaevna, in the Lodes ghetto. Husbandry. 
in the stench and the black of the animal hold on the Adam Mackenzie out of Liverpool, you speak softly to the Arabian, calming her with Danny Deaver and Invictus. Knowing from your parents' farm that horses need human voices, fear confinement, come to harm like children, you will feed her carrots, sugar cubes, Tennyson, every day of the voyage. Then supervise her hoisting in rope harness you designed and rigged to the pier in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. She'll be balky entering the van and you will, uh, until you gentle her and receive your tip of $50 from the owner. Two more to go, people. Two more poems. This poem is my uh, entry in the conversation that poets like to have about their own funeral arrangements. And some of you will discover, uh, will hear some uh, uh, homages to, to my better to my betters, to some great poets who have written poems of this sort in the poem. At Davy's urn. At Davy's urn, let no one wear a tie. Let all smoke dope whose mortgages are paid, or children gone from home, or mates content. No prayers or seminars allowed. No art displayed. Let's start in twilight on my backyard deck and eat and drink enough to keep our talk alive at least through 3 or 4 a.m. When some may go, but most of you stay on for songs, poached eggs, and vivid argument to keep my drowsy empress awake and save the earth from ill and fix the sky Oh, wait till dawn before you say goodbye. Last poem. Dream work. Car repair was not in his repertoire, but here he is working a ratchet wrench under the hood of my blue station wagon. The 68 Ford with a hot spot in the cargo area where the kids would dry their bathing suits after the beach. He turns from the work now, hobbling strangely. My shoes, he says, where are my shoes? The kids are grown and far away. The shoes are 10 years gone to goodwill with his decent shirts and the woolen long johns he wore at sea before he came ashore to make me. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very, very much. Songs and poached eggs on your backyard porch. I think we'd all like to be there. This Me too. <laughs> um, the, uh, there will be some questions and comments, perhaps, and, and Andrew will uh, moderate them so that I don't press the wrong button and suddenly uh, turn on the air conditioning. Um, um, I have one quick question for you, and it's very open-ended. Uh, you've had a distinguished career as a scholar. Uh, you have your first book of poetry published. How does that feel? What's your process for writing a poem? <laughs> my, my process is writing 80 years, is, is waiting 80 years for the, for the courage. The truth is, I, to tell you honestly, I, I, I actually think 
now that I reflect on my balked career in some ways, I've, I've had a wonderful career and I don't mean to denigrate it in that way, but I've written much less than I intended and I've struggled with my writing much more than I have wanted to in my life. I'm proud of what I've written and I think I've written important work, but I've written much less than I expected to be able to and it's been a real burden to me. I think that one reason was that I had a kind of poet's tendency in me from the beginning, but couldn't let myself acknowledge it or see it. And I, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is te my temperament. I mean, I'm a fuss budget. I'm a, oh, I, 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 it's, it's almost, it's, it's, I think, part of what makes me a very good writing teacher because I can't bear to let even mistakes go by. So I fill my, my students' comments with, with my students' papers with ridiculous grammatical complaints, you know? Uh, so there's, there's a kind of uh, a fuss budget side to me, almost an obsessive side to me about trying to get things exactly right, which, which poetry can allow because you can work on single lines for so long, right? And I would often do this in my essays and it, and it would take a long time. And then I would get into horrible arguments with editors, especially when I began to write popular culture ess essays about television and forms of popular culture, because the editors I was reading were, how to put this gently, uh, less well read than I would like. So I would, I would put in allusions, really famous lines, Shakespearean lines that everyone knows, and they would, they would edit them and fix the grammar and things like that. I would get in these ridiculous, and, I re, and I, I, a lot of my career was spent in time defending my prose against editors I thought were, often were much younger than I and much stupider than I. And I realized that, that, that so, so in any case, what I liked was to work on sentences and, and, parent, and, and I think it also had to do with the attention span. Right. But I could. But but the other thing, the confession I'm making is this. I went to graduate school. I was surrounded by great poets, people who be I mean, friend, dear friends of mine, but people I admired and that I shared seminar rooms with two of them became poet laureates. A third, I think, is a poet at least as good as those two. Uh, uh, it was an environment of such remarkable poetic intensity that I was I was a kind of fringe member of it. Uh, and I was friends with those people, but I think I was, I think they intimidated me without my acknowledging it to myself. Uh, I can't be sure that that was true, but I, to be honest, that's what I think it was. And I also think, to be really honest, I was able to unlock my ability to write poetry when it was too old to matter. When the com competition was over, it didn't matter. I'm still very grateful that I was able to write these. And I do regret that I didn't uh, take it more, take this quality in me more seriously. I have been writing poems all my life. And some of the poems in here, I started many years ago, but most of them are an old man's poems because I became a better writer as I got older. And the final point is, of course, I don't really think in the end that there's such a big difference between my best paragraphs and my best poems. I think I wrote really good prose. And I think the, the, the attention I gave to my prose was unusual. I don't think it never happens. I think there are many very great prose writers that I admire tremendously. Um, I can, I'll name two that will offend people. They're both political conservatives or, or thought to be political conservatives, even though they're not. One is Simon Shama, the historian. I think he's one of the greatest prose writers of English who ever lived. Another prose writer I tremendously admire is Steven Pinker. Uh, now, they're not poets, and they don't write with a poet's compression, but I admire them very much. So I don't, I, I, uh, uh, those are some of the reasons. But it, but it is also true that reading my poems to audiences, even the few times I've done it, this event tonight, was so much more valuable, moving, rewarding, pleasurable to me than any lecture I ever gave. And I've given hundreds of lectures, some of them really good to big audiences. I'm proud of them. They were good work. But reading your own poems, boy, I wish I'd had this experience all my life as you have, Ed. <laughs> but that's enough. That's enough of this. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm grateful for the chance to have done it. And I believe I believe in these poems. I, I, I believe that these are good poems. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to have lived long enough to have written them. Thank you, David. I'm going to pass it over to Andrew, who has been collecting uh, various uh, questions coming through in chat. Yep. And I'll just disappear, Andrew. Is that the idea? <laughs> Not too far, yes. but yeah. Yes, goodbye. Um, Thanks, Ed. Good. 
So I, and, I and thanks want... for that wonderful, generous introduction. That was really wonderful. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful reading, David. Thanks. Absolutely wonderful. Um, I wanted to comment how nice it is looking at the attendee list and seeing so many people with the last name Thorborn. Oh, I think, I think that's great. Are there so uh, many? I didn't know that. <laughs> I thought five or six at least. Um, well, that's all right. There are a lot of. Uh, well, I have uh, three boys, three children. <laughs> I have two granddaughters. I should have at least five there. Yep. My wife um, hasn't come, I guess. I'm going to be very <laughs> unhappy. <laughs> and a, a number of other familiar names. And one of them is uh, Stephen Tapscott um, from, from literature has a question <laughs> saying, I admired and enjoyed these poems when I read them in the book. And so it was interesting to hear you revising some of them or critiquing the aesthetic on the fly as you presented them. And that in turn makes me wonder if you're rethinking aesthetic positions, how or why, which further makes me wonder if you're writing new poems and if so, what's new? How do they differ from these passionate quote, early poems? What's to look forward to? <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. That's a very generous question. Um, I, I guess I, 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 am, I am still trying to write, although I'm writing with the same slowness. I've written a few new poems that are, I think are okay, but these poems took me like, even after I got serious about 10 years, I, all of them are much long, were much longer in their original, in their original form. I, if I have a style, I guess it would be called minimalist. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I once wrote a poem called um, uh, a Mission Statement, and I realized it was so bloated that I titled it Nearly Streamlined Mission Statement. And then I wrote a, <laughs> another another poem called Mission Statement. And essentially, the, this was the mission statement. Um, don't lie. Scour, scour each line and the spaces between them. Scour each poem. Scour them. Scour each piece of punctuation scour again <laughs> that's my that's that's my that's my so it, it takes me a long time but I, I i have especially because there's nothing at stake except my pleasure in the work um i have gotten tremendous pleasure from this kind of whittling away at the poems and making them as short as possible one thing i've tried to do and i've succeeded in a few poems that i think uh friends of mine I respect have said it, have, have, they admire, uh, are their poems without any punctuation at all. They go, uh, sometimes I'll put a period at the end. They're poems without punctuation that are still, uh, and uh, they're, 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 they're perfectly readable, even though they're quite long. I mean, in fact, the first poem I read is an example of that. There is no punctuation in that poem. That's what, I was bragging a little when I said uh, in the last line, like this sentence, the original version was like the sentence, like a sentence, but then I got boastful and I said like this sentence <laughs> because I was so proud of what the poem had, had managed to do. Not a full yeah. answer to your question, Steve, but a partial one. So I am still writing. Uh, I don't know if they're changing that much, but I, I did change the poems on the fly because I became aware of the difference between hearing a poem and hear, having it being read to you as against reading it. And I felt that I needed to give, even though I had to violate some of the lineation in order to give a kind of emphasis appropriate to an oral presentation. And if I had thought more about this question, I might have done more of that. I, and I, I, it is not a question I've thought deeply enough about, but it's very interesting to me. Uh, I, I remember my friend, former colleague and poet, Barry Spax, many of you may remember him. He used to teach at MIT. And then he went to California where he had a wonderful career as a poet. Spax was a magnificent reader of his own poetry, very dramatic. He could put on voices and so on. And I often felt that his poems were much better listened to than read. This is a cruel thing to say about a wonderful man who was kind to me and I admired, but I think it was true. He wrote, and he wrote a book, wonderful books of poems, many books, but hearing him read was a far more memorable experience than reading his poems by yourself. I guess I hope that's not true of my poems. I don't know, I, I hope I read well, I apologize for searching through my book that way for the pages. I had marked them more carefully, but my page markers fell out <laughs> out of my nervousness before I began reading. Hmm. Great. Um, let's keep one thing in our back pocket here. Uh, Stephen, oh no, sorry, uh, Richard Cross 
wonders if you might be able to read knots. So if we have, if we have time, yeah. maybe that's something yeah. that we should come I, back to. That's a kind question. Should I should I wait to do it to let? It's it's the title poem of the of the book and the longest poem, but still none of my poems are very long, as you can tell. This is so maybe. Uh, I, it's uh, two short pages long. It's not a long poem. I'd love to read it. It's the, it's the title poem of the book, and it, it does give a, a kind of, uh, a, 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 a additional uh, uh, energy to this to that spine of stories about my father. All right. Uh, let's take one question then, and and then how about you? You read that one, Nick Monfort. Uh, if I can uh, find my book, yes, yeah. I can. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Nick asks, uh, how has your experience as a poet, publishing and reading your work? changed your teaching of poetry. <laughs> Frankly, Nick, it's made me want to teach my own poems. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I, mean I, I became jealous of the attention that we're giving. <laughs> but it, the truth is, it's made me, I, I would reverse it. The fact is, the fact that I think I was always a very attentive and engaged and even passionate close reader of very um, demanding modernist poetry helped me a lot. It gave me standards, you know. I mean, there were there, there was a certain level of crap I could not write because I had been immersed in great poets all my life. I'd been hearing them and listening to them. Not to mention the great contemporaries like Stephen Tapscott, who asked me a generous question, or Robert Pinsky, or R Robert Haas, two poet laureates, or or James McMichael, an incredibly great poet, roughly roughly my generation. Uh, astonishing rich book. I mean, I had their voices in my head all my life. So uh, they wouldn't let me go too far wrong, even though I didn't have the skill to reach their levels and the, uh, or, or the experience. I mean, you know, I sometimes wonder if I had started at the beginning, maybe I could have talked to them in a, in a serious way. I don't mean to denigrate my own poems. I believe in them very deeply. But I also have a realistic sense of where they belong in the, in the pantheon of poetry. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, Wooden Kelly asks, David, when you describe your writing, I think of your description of your father gentling horses. Is there a way in which shaping a poem is like calming a bulky animal? I guess I'm wondering how much your father, the subject of your poems, might also have provided a model of a writer. Hmm. That's a very smart question. And when I hadn't thought about it in that way, I mean, I've always thought of my father as a kind of model. Uh, of a kind, although also a negative model, as you can see from the one really negative poem I wrote about him. There are other negative things about him that emerge in the book. It's a not a not. It's a. I think it's a. It's a very. It's ambivalent. It's deeply divided. So in Wynne's question, it's very, very acute. Um, I thought he was a model. He taught me how to use tools. He taught me about precision, and I. I do have one poem. Uh, I realize now that. That 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 does explain that uh, maybe maybe really I'm reaching down here for my book uh, that that does explain that re really really powerfully uh, and maybe the poem will explain it better than better than anything if I can find it quickly um, I can't find it quickly. <laughs> um, uh, so so I so I so I won't I won't bother uh, uh, trying to. Trying to trying to discover it at so late uh, uh, when we have so little time, but uh, and, and if it if I find it uh, uh, in in, a, in in when I'm reading the other poem and looking through the book, I'll, I'll 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 dig it out again. But the basic idea was he taught me precision. He taught me he taught me respect for um, accuracy. Um, uh, he. Uh, he he had a he had a, a mathematical and an architectural bent in a certain way. He liked he he always wished he had been an architect. I think and and uh, and he knew and he knew an immense amount. Of, he was an he had an incredible amount of practical knowledge. So maybe his attitude toward tools and toward the uses of tools affected my attitude toward words and the uses of words. It certainly affected my desire to clean them and abrade them and sand them down. <laughs> Right and scour them. Right, I mean, a lot of the metaphors I use for working them do are are, are metaphors that come from tools and tool making. Great. Uh, so to go back to Richard Cross's request, would you like to read nuts? Yes, I'll read nuts. Thirty-four. Maybe this would. Maybe we should end on this note. 
Okay. I mean, everyone's had enough. And this is a, let me find the poem. Sorry, people. Now, this is because I'm nervous. I think after all this time, all these audiences, that's another thing. When I read poetry to audiences, I'm nervous. And I never was nervous as a teacher. <laughs> it's something different. It's something wonderful. I, I'm so happy to it happened to me in my old age. <laughs> and Richard, Richard's being very helpful. He says, page 34. Right, thanks. <laughs> where, I have where, it. I have it, <laughs> Richard. I, I have it already. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> very homey. Uh, nuts. The bride's necklace titles against resistance, but never fully closes. Named and rigged so by an unknown, possibly Scots or Cockney sailor, 300 years ago. Maybe the Matthew Walker whose namesake nuts for sale as a keepsake in nautical museums in Sydney and Dunedin. Among the laps and the aborigines of Borneo, knots or knotted garments are taboo for pregnant women and their husbands, lest the delivery be restricted. No crossing of legs, no locking of house or cupboard until the child comes. The hangman's noose with nine turns is made exactly as the hangman's noose with seven turns, except for the two extra turns reserved by long tradition for white men. The cuckold neck, AKA half crown sizing, doubles the strength of the round sizing by forming the eye at the point where both ropes cross. This loop knot was invented for the murderous, harpoon, murderous harpoons they called dolphin strikers aboard the old whalers. The secret of the Turkish archer's knot is lost. Joining slingshot to bowstring, the knot is illustrated and carefully described in many documents, but no archer in a thousand years has achieved the killing range, 800 yards, of the ancient bowmen who made this knot sacred to Allah. The knot in your belly from bad clams, the one in your chest for angina, the knot in my head and heart when I remember too much. A fellow in his frenzy says the heart is a cistern where foul toads knot and gender. The triple hitch has saved many lives, including, said my father once or twice, a drunken Dutchman, lonely for his wife, who pitched fed head first into the forward cargo hold and dangled swinging by his hitched right ankle, laughing and vomiting before they cut him down to hose his mess before the morning watch on the SS California, New York to San Diego, via Havana and the Panama Canal. The knot of Hercules secures the girdle barring entrance to Vestal Virgin's most sacred parts. Our oldest knot, the square knot, sometimes called the reef knot nowadays, so strong and perfect to its uses, its strength increasing under strain and use, that it was said to be the God's invention and was remembered in erotic rites, once widely practiced on patrician wedding nights. The bridal gown held barely shut by this God's knot is gently, is gently nibbled open by the groom. Thank you, David. Thank you thank for sharing your beautiful poems with us and thank you all for uh, attending. And uh, we're off to spring. Thanks again, David. That was wonderful. Thank you very much for all of you for coming.